Thank you for coming. So I will introduce the last keynote speaker, Charles Waldheim. Uh, Charles Waldheim is a Canadian-American architect, urban theorist and educator. Waldheim's research examines the relationship between landscape, ecology and contemporary urbanism. He's the author, editor and co-editor of numerous books on these subjects and his writing has been published and translated internationally. Waldheim is professor and chair of landscape architecture at Harvard University, Graduate School of Design. He has lectured internationally and has taught at Rice University, University of Toronto, University of Pennsylvania, and University of Michigan. Waldheim is recipient of the Rome Prize Fellowship from the American Academy in Rome, a Business Scholar Research Fellowship at the Study Center of the Canadian Center for Architecture, and Chair at RISE and the Sanders Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Charles Waldheim. Thank you so much for that. Um, thanks to um, everyone for the invitation to be here. It was a rich, it's a pleasure always. Peter Seglione, nice to be here. Thank you so much. Um, this RES conference, um, the first one, a year and a half ago now, was such an important meeting for us in the US. I think for us at Harvard, I was very sad not to be able to be there, um, but it's still reverberating with us, the conversation that took place there. And so I was very pleased to accept the invitation to join you here uh, today. Um, thanks, of course, to Casa Clima, uh, our friends at the University of Trent. Um, this is a, an important conversation for us. Uh, we look forward to an ongoing conversation with you here and our colleagues uh, at Harvard. Uh, and it's nice to see so many um, old friends and colleagues and make some, um, make some new ones as well. My brief remarks today are going to be focused on really um, the conversation that we're engaged in just now um, at Harvard, um, in which ecology, um, as um, my friend Michael Jacob said so eloquently, this last ideology uh, we're trying to unpack um, as an adjective to urbanism, as a modifier to urbanism. Um, as um, Jeanette Sordi mentioned earlier in her presentation, in, in her work, she's been working on a kind of intellectual history of uh, landscape urbanism. And as she said, uh, we think of ecological urbanism as both um, a continuation of that discourse, but also um, a critique of, the, let's say, the limitations of landscape or um, the baggage that landscape brings, um, landscape's luggage, I like to think of it as. Um, so in that regard, the, the discourse around ecological urbanism is itself now a few years old. Um, it's in its first iteration really a, a Spanish term. It's now been absorbed into English in a certain way and is now being translated back into Spanish, and Portuguese, and Mandarin, and a range of other languages, and we can talk about that. Um, when I joined um, the faculty at the GSD um, uh, uh, a few years ago, for my colleagues there, Mosa Mostafavi and myself and others, we thought of this really as a coming back together of a group of people that had been working separately for a period of time. Uh, and again, as, as Jeanette's book points out, many of us happened to be at the University of Pennsylvania in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and in that context, we think of what we're doing now at the GSD as really a continuation of that conversation, uh, but again, a, a more precise formulation, a more specific set of questions. So my, my comments will be organized really in three parts. The first will be a brief uh, prehistory of that uh, material and a situation of, of what does it mean to uh, think of ecology as uh, plural and projective. Uh, the, the main body of what I have to say will, will introduce this, this topic of a projective ecologies and situate that as an intellectual history because we're, we're particularly interested in thinking about uh, modes of human subjectivity and modes of thinking about work in the city. Uh, and then I'll conclude with a particular uh, project from the past year that we've been engaged in at the GSD, which is looking at the case of the airport as a site for contemporary work. Ecological urbanism uh, has emerged, as I said, as a continuation critique of the conversation on landscape urbanism. Landscape urbanism itself emerged really out of um, two or three different tendencies in the discourse about cities. Initially, it was founded by people at the University of Pennsylvania 
that were engaged in a kind of radical phenomenology. People that had worked with Joseph Rickward, and people that had been at the University of Essex or at Cambridge, uh, and then at the Architectural Association. Uh, this was then joined to a conversation about event and program, and thinking about the city less in terms of architectural or stylistic terms, and more in terms of uh, human action, human subjectivity, and phenomenal experience. Ultimately, the intersection between design culture and ecological performance allowed landscape urbanism to become relevant to a range of audiences uh, internationally. That's still an ongoing project. But at the same moment, in the last several years, we've been increasingly focusing on, uh, on ecology as having transcended its status as a simple natural science to occupy a status a bit more today, uh, more, more complicated, but also more central to thinking about cities. And so in this regard, we think of our work as more of a kind of um, disciplinary formation. We think of the work of the making of the school and the construction of discourse as an active project. Uh, and we think of um, the challenges that we're facing in urbanization globally as producing a set of conditions that our professions need to respond to. In that context, the potential for professional response, we believe, is ahead of disciplinary conditions, but at the same moment, we must reform our disciplines so as to keep pace with those changes. And that reflexive relationship between the work of professionals in cities and disciplinary formation in the academy is something that we're very, very focused on. In the wake of the Ecological Urbanism uh, Conference and then publication um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, as we assembled a team from my team in the Department of Landscape Architecture, uh, we recruited a group of people that had been working on, on various topics adjacent to this, uh, including uh, Chris Reed uh, from the University of Pennsylvania and a, a, a planner ecologist called Nina Marie Lister from Ryerson University in Toronto. And in my first year at, at Harvard, and having recruited them to join the faculty there, I asked them to organize a conference in 2010, 2011, and then ultimately a publication that's just out last year under the rubric of projective ecologies. The work of this uh, project, this conference publication, was meant to ask some basic questions about what does it mean to take ecology as a natural science and use it as an adjective to change the way that we think about cities. In that context, um, we're increasingly aware of the idea that ecology provides for us a not uncomplicated, but at times useful cultural lens, and one that has really at least three levels or three layers uh, of value. You're, of course, aware of the origins of ecology in the German um, in the second half of the 19th century. I'm showing you here one uh, formulation translated from the German, a form of formative text by Ernst Haeckel, General Morphology der Organismen, in which he defines the kind of classical canonical definition of ecology. The study of the relationship between species and their environments. No? It seems simple. It's important to note, of course, this is a model in which our particular species are not, are not in the model. <laughs> These are other species, right, in a kind of classical 19th century uh, formulation. That foundation of the relationship between species and their environment persists today. It's as, it's as if it's still with us. And in the history of ideas, it's now become, I think, very productively complicated by at least two other ways of thinking about ecology, both of which have emerged really in the, in, 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 in the more recent history of the second half of the 20th century. The second of those um, you might think about as the embeddedness of our species in that old model, the idea that we humans as a species are both embedded in and producing the model of ecology itself. And in this regard, we, we could refer to uh, Bateson's formulation from 72 in English, which I quite like, about the charm and terror, the twin, the twin attributes of ecology, the charm and terror, in which um, the ecology for which we're planning is itself something that we've not only constructed as a human construct, but we're also <coughs> embedded in it. And that reflexive condition is something that persists and is not, not unproblematic itself as a way of thinking about ultimately, um, this new modification of the urban uh, biology. But even at that moment, and you might think of Bateson or the work of others as the kind of rising sense of an environmentalism or a kind of post-humanism in environmental thought, has been further problematized um, by a range of thinkers in the postmodern era. And here I'll give you one example from Guattari, in which um, in Guattari's Three Ecologies, 
um, he argues that ultimately ecology is equally valuable for us, not simply as um, the image of a small kind of nature-loving minority or certain specialists, specializations, professional identities, but that ultimately ecology is broad enough to subsume within it um, the whole of human subjectivity. Now, I don't know if you have an appetite for guitar this late in the day or if that's an overreach, but I want to just suggest there's a very expanded field in which ecology is thought about today. So in my brief uh, forward to the Project of Ecology's publication, and in his introductory essay, Christopher Height from Rice University argues that um, ecology is now at the level or at the status of an epistemology. You know, it's a way of thinking about the world today, and it's one that's both productive and problematic in the ways that we've discussed, um, but that ultimately it occupies a kind of privileged status for us in these fields, in urbanism, in architecture, in landscape architecture, and it is true that landscape architects bring a particular um, proximity to this subject matter, and that's not unrelated to um, the ascendancy of landscape as a form of urbanism over the last decade or more. In that context, a part of what we've been focusing on, our team has been looking at, is the idea that if, in fact, ecology has become a kind of generalized epistemology for our age, what does that mean relative to the projected act of design, to the work of architects and urbanists and the things we've been discussing uh, today? Among the things that we might say is that um, while ecologists <coughs> and architects um, come from very, very different worldviews and have very, very different um, paradigms. They share, among other things, the idea that ecology is useful for both of those disciplines, primarily as model. That is, neither urbanist nor ecologist intervenes directly through a kind of scientific method. On the one hand, um, cities are so complicated that we, as we've heard today, we can't wait for all the data. <laughs> Cities are complex, non-linear, multivariate problems in which a scientific model is largely inadequate. Having said that, we do have a range of examples coming both from ecology as a natural science, but equally from the design fields, that designers and ecologists build models of the world, and it's in those models, in those representations, if you will, that we intervene. And so it's that point of tangency between the thinking of the natural scientist and the thinking of the designer that the Projective Ecologies project has played out. And it draws upon not only some classic texts, which it reprints, but equally includes a range of contemporary essays by authors um, that are less well circulated. And it also significantly, I think, includes um, the very models of representation that urbanists and ecologists have developed. And I'm showing you here by example the work of uh, Richard Foreman, our Richard Foreman at, at the GSD, a permanent English language landscape ecologist. Um, and Foreman's interest in models of species migration relative to habitat structure, questions of patch and matrix. And while this is a discourse that emerged really out of landscape ecology in the 70s and 80s, it's been broadly absorbed into architectural and urban discourse but without some um, level of uh, tension at the same moment. Um, I often, I don't know about you, I often go to conferences of ecologists and urbanists these days, and um, they tend to follow a certain pattern. And I'm happy to say that today's event uh, and Rome's uh, Reds conference did not follow that pattern. But the more typical formulation I see is which it's a two-day format. The first day, the ecologists get to speak. I don't know why they always get to go first, but they do. And they speak from the position of truth, right? It's science, and they say that at the end of every presentation, we need more study. And this is incontrovertible. Of course we need more study. The second day, the first architect walks to the podium and says, I'm going to China on Tuesday. I need help now. And the ecologists are freaked out because they didn't realize that we were implicated in the fact that we were all going to hell very quickly. You know? And so it emerges out of this kind of conversation, an incredibly fraught set of relationships in which the scientific model, the idea of testing, hypothesis, falsification, additional data, publication, the production of knowledge through science, is an incredibly estranged relationship to the production of space. You know? And at the same moment, we're hopeful that in thinking about ecology in a, hopefully a, a critical way, uh, we might be able to recuperate it as a way of thinking about uh, models for design and, and for urbanism. Of course, the impact of Foreman's work on uh, the discourse of landscape urbanism is self-evident. The absorption of that work by Stan Allen and then Jim Corner, Stan Allen, and their early work um, as Corner and Allen paired together to do work like this, including Nina Marie Lister as ecological planner, 
we saw an emergence of a kind of work um, which is, while now over-reported, we could say it was significant as a breakthrough in which ecological thinking could inform uh, the modeling of, of spatial projection. Um, likewise, in that regard, and I'll return to this in my conclusion, uh, in the work of Bernard Schumi, we've seen an arc that had moved from an interest in the city as a space of politics and culture, the idea of the event, as opposed to the architectural container at the beginning of his career, to a point now where, uh, by the time he did these diagrams for Downsview Park a couple of years ago, he himself had absorbed models of succession and change and transformation as somehow imbricated in the urban uh, model. The Projective Ecologies uh, project has organized itself in a series of concepts and key terms. So in addition to representational tools and models, the idea of some key concepts. I'm showing you one here, the concept of dynamics. That is, natural systems and urban systems are themselves changing. They change over time. Uh, you might think of, in this case, the work of um, Adrian Hoos, West Eight, for the Shell Project, the kind of North Sea barrier, islands, and the idea of change over time. And this spatial design and equally ecological interventions as mitigating and dealing with that and embracing it somehow. The second concept put forward is, again, this concept of succession. The idea that often natural systems are seen to move in fairly predictable patterns from levels of sophistication or simplicity to levels of complexity over time. And increasingly we see designers, architects, landscape architects, urban designers, building their work upon concepts of succession over time which are ultimately perhaps um, less than linear, ultimately while uh, projectable or predictable, are not quite, um, not quite assured. It's in this space that we can talk about the concept of emergence, the idea that new conditions, new species, new habitats, new relationship between species are constantly bubbling up, and in the pressure for success, and the pressure for um, the replication of one's own, with one's own uh, DNA or one's own spatial proclivities, we see the concept of new conditions. Uh, in this case, I'm showing you the work of Sean Lally uh, and his interest in um, a kind of thermodynamic field, a kind of gradient field in which human beings relate to their environments across kind of gradients of, of, the, of the spectrum of, of radiation, but that ultimately in which uh, the architect is organizing energy flows and fields and spatial spectra as opposed to containers of space. As we've heard today, many, many uh, designers, architects, urbanists are concerned and interested in concepts of resilience, that is to find the ability of a system or a species or a set of relationships to return to some steady state after some perturbation or crisis. Uh, in this regard, uh, the work of Chris Reed and Stoss I think is remarkable as a practice of, of landscape urbanism in which a key indicator species, in this case the interface between a river and a lake mouth in Toronto, are indicators of a potential for an ecological system to return to some level of productivity uh, and health. And then ultimately, topic, the topic of adaptability. The ability not simply to return through resilience to some previous state, but actually to adapt, to grow a new limb, to develop an entirely new system, to completely change one's, one's um, genetic code or spatial projection relative to um, changes in the system that are slightly more catastrophic or threatening to previous uh, forms uh, of life. Uh, in this regard, I, I'm showing you here one drawing by uh, Anu Mathur, Dilip de Kuna, the University of Pennsylvania, looking at the adaptability of public space in relationship to certain species and certain forms of, of inundation uh, by water. So I, I'm not here to tell you anything new. I think all of this is quite well established. But it, it does suggest to me uh, and my colleagues at Harvard that there is an important uh, intellectual project here, not simply the, the practical work, uh, not simply the professional obligation to deal with the challenges that we face, but ultimately for us to reconfigure our disciplinary preparation for those challenges, and in particular to focus on questions of language, the intellectual history of these topics, and questions of representation and model building, so as to provide the ability for a communication. Um, it's very difficult for us to work across disciplines if we, share, if we don't share a basic uh, language. Yeah? As you know, uh, cities and natural systems um, they really often transcend simple disciplinary boundaries. Uh, there's no single discipline or profession in this room that can really speak to the complexity of their intersection, their relationship. So questions of sustainability, questions of uh, climate change and sea level rise, these things are imbricated, often fraught, hairy problems, wicked problems, when I think of them as, and in which no one particular profession or disciplinary viewpoint uh, ought to be privileged. 
And at the same moment, we can't be reconfiguring our professional and disciplinary identities every 15 minutes in response to a new challenge. And so it's in that space that we do believe that uh, ecology has become and will be, for some time at least, an important language or lens through which to understand a set of problems. We don't mean to suggest that we have it all sorted out, but we do think that there's an interesting set of uh, questions there, um, and we're interested to bridge that with um, models of representation and ways of thinking about and speaking about systems that might be available um, to people. In addition to questions of disciplinary formation, and institution building, and building a discourse and professional abilities, uh, we also do believe uh, that we need uh, cases, we need conditions to intervene upon and to work upon. And in that regard, last year we organized a conference at the GSD and an exhibition under the concept of airport landscape. Uh, we believe that in addition to other sites and subjects, that the airport occupies a privileged status in contemporary uh, urbanity. And equally, it occupies a, a particularly relevant, I think, productive site relative to these questions of uh, ecology. Uh, airport landscape is not my formulation. It's, of course, the work of the late uh, Dennis Cosgrove. Um, Cosgrove was the first person that I saw to use the formulation in English language at the end of the 20th century. In his 1999 essay uh, under the same title, Cosgrove argued that, quote, if the erasure of conventional spatial boundaries is the most salient feature of the late 20th century condition, then the airport might be taken as its most perfect landscape expression. And that, for me, sums up, um, in addition to you know, photos by Andres Gursky and others, the centrality of the airport. The airfield is planned for a site as far away from the city that it serves as is conceivable in present configuration. And it rapidly comes to be become the center of that metropolitan area very quickly in many conditions by virtue of the transportation infrastructure that it produces. Uh, that contradiction, right? On the one hand, we see the airport as a vast emptiness, and when we come to understand its renewed centrality, we think of the airport as a kind of model for a kind of city making. Um, I have to confess that I have a slight perverse pleasure in that, uh, in part because it's the, the radical vacuity of the airport that for me stands in, as much as any other space in the city, as a kind of model or an image for the uh, vacuity of modern life, uh, and I am not that far away from the Calbo images that we saw uh, in Jakob's presentation as well. In this regard, um, we think of the airport not as uh, an exception to the city. Uh, we think of the airport not as set aside and not apart, apart from the urbanism, but in fact fundamentally bound up uh, economically and culturally in the life of cities. And it also produces a kind of fairly stark contrast we could decide in the context of climate change and carbon to stop flying, but you have to go pretty far left on the spectrum to find people that have stopped flying. I was very pleased to be on a design competition um, with a range of people working out of uh, Rotterdam a couple of years ago, and I was very pleased to tell Sienna, my wife, that we were on a team with Brian Eno. And she said, that's fantastic, Brian Eno's amazing. And I said, absolutely, when do you meet him? And I said, I, I don't get to meet him because he's not flying anymore. <laughs> so there's a, there is a kind of position in which one could abandon the carbon implications of flight because the carbon implications of flight far surpass um, those of automobility and some other conditions we've been talking about today. And at the same moment, to do so would be to abandon the level of economy and globalization and international conversation that we've now come to associate with a whole range of other things that we could, we could talk about. So I don't mean to go on in, in great length about that, but I also think that the the, the problem of the airport also raises a whole set of problematics, a whole set of problematique for us dealing with the projection of the city. It's very, very difficult to take the modern airport, what it means economically, how it operates ecologically, its cultural status, and squeeze that toothpaste back into the tube of the traditional urban form. It's a challenge to do so. And we've seen examples where architects and artists have tried to do this, but it's a particular uh, challenge because the site of the airport is filled up with all of that engineered margin for error. Every square meter on the airport surface is not empty, it's actually filled with things. It's filled with flows of water and snow pile and salt and a range of other um, uh, spaces set aside for when things might go um, catastrophically wrong. And of course, we know that that catastrophe is not something that's simply a contingency that's being planned for. It's in fact built into the very systems uh, itself. 
In that context, uh, the exhibition um, and conference were organized last year, and the, the, the electronic publication, the PDF, is available on ISSU. If you want to find this, I can get you to it. Um, organized itself to look at two conditions for the modern airport. The first is the operating airport as a site for ecology and design, uh, in which we, of course, looked at a range of case studies. I think West 8's work, Adrian Hose's work at Schiphol Airport outside of Amsterdam for two decades, I think is as exemplary a case study as we have in the work of the landscape architect as urbanist on the airfield as an ongoing site. Uh, a part of the breakthrough here was not simply using um, species in their relationship, right, birds and bees and clover and honey and birch trees in a set of uh, sympathetic relationships, but ultimately the breakthrough was for Adrian and his team to abandon altogether the idea of making detailed planting plans. The airport is a complicated operational space, it's an engineering space, it's a technical space in which the specifications for how to build and maintain this landscape had to be dis disseminated to a very large non-professional team. And in abandoning the making of detailed planting plans, Audrey was able to both change the business model for how landscape architects might work by cutting out an entire phase of design work, but ultimately also had, I think, a bigger impact uh, on the space of the airport. We also, of course, survey a range of more uh, progressive or at least more diverse species at work in various airports around the world. There are incredible experiments going on with various species whether they be sheep, goats, llama. Uh, among my favorites, uh, juxtaposed in the exhibition and in, in the publication, is this. This is a Dutch product, the Robo Bird, which is uh, a drone. You can purchase this now online, and you can fly it electronically around your airfield to scare off predators. Of course, among the central preoccupations of those that manage and operate airfields is bird strikes and birds being sucked into jet engines, and that ultimately the um, management and regulation of uh, spaces for uh, habitat is a fundamental preoccupation. What we see generally is a shift away from very 20th century, very toxic, completely um, uh, tabula rasa strategies to basically reduce the ecology of the airfield to a zero state or to remove biologic function almost entirely. And in favor of that, more recently, we see a range of progressive practices. I, I don't know your politics on drones or where you fit the robo bird into that spectrum. I'm not even sure I know how I feel about it. It was important for us to show this in relationship to its 19th century precedent. This is a peregrine falcon, which is a piece from the Museum of Natural History uh, at Harvard University. It's a falcon from the 19th century. And I also, again, I take a perverse pleasure in the idea that the falcon is a real object that predates powered flight. And at the same moment, its mimicry in the, in the drone is the thing which is the faux object, which is actually available and on sale. Um, a similar juxtaposition is available with the coyote, which appears in the literature and in the kind of popular imaginary of the abandoned airfield. Uh, we included here the, the, the faux coyote, which again you can purchase and is available and is installed across airports, at least in North America, in relationship to um, kind of producing certain behaviors in certain species that are seen to be uh, desirable. In addition to the, um, uh, the, the photograph of um, Gursky that I showed you uh, earlier, uh, we've also included a range of other photographers uh, in the, the image and frontispiece of, of the show. We included the work of the Parisian aerial photographer Jan Artus Bertrand, who's done some really remarkable images of airfields. Um, we also um, included um, this, which is by Phil Underdown, a North American photographer of an abandoned airfield. Because, of course, as soon as you plan the airfield, you're also planning for its redundancy, its obsolescence. Uh, we live in a culture, we live in a world in which, of course, the abandonment of hundreds and hundreds of airports around the world is an ongoing fact, uh, not only by virtue of the shrinking cities phenomenon in places like Detroit and, and elsewhere, but equally in cities that are growing very fast and in which the scale and, and force of growth is in fact making the previous condition of the airfield obsolete. And so in that regard, we use the abandoned airfield as a lens through which to look at these forms of uh, intervention and try to gather together some, um, some cases, some best practices in which uh, architects, urbanists, landscape architects are intervening on the site of the former airfield to great effect. Um, a part of what appeals to us here is that the scale of the airfield often precludes immediate urbanization. In most cases, the fact of the abandonment of the airfield does not produce an immediate urbanization at the scale that the air, airfield operated. And so in that regard, of course, questions of succession have been quite central. I've already shown and mentioned earlier the competition for Downsview Park outside of Toronto. Uh, in this case, um, 
uh, th this project has now become a kind of canonical example, again, this is the work of Bernard Chumi, Derek Revington, and others, in which succession became, for Chumi and for his team, a way of thinking about a very large airport site that had been engineered to remove biologic function, but in order to allow biologic function to return. One way of thinking about this in the context of our present economy is the effects of a kind of neoliberalism, right? Uh, if in the 19th or 20th century we had public funding to build the public realm, increasingly in projects like this, what we find is that the airfield, even though it's nominally publicly owned, doesn't produce enough revenue or absent future urbanization to reproduce itself. And it's in that space that natural processes, succession and the like, are being called upon to produce a more uh, biodiverse, uh, a more sustainable, if you will, public realm, then we can afford to, or at least have the public will to build uh, immediately. Uh, in this regard, there's a, a larger conversation to be had about the political economy that undergirds the resurgence of landscape. Um, I believe that um, the emergence of landscape urbanism in the last uh, two decades is really the third moment in the last couple of hundred years in which uh, the change in industrial economy produces a condition where architecture finds it hard to respond and into which landscape has stepped. The first of those was the invention of landscape architecture in the second half of the 19th century in a conversation between New York and Paris in which economic and rapid, rapidly uh, urbanizing areas in the context of industrial economy demanded a new uh, urban professional. In that context, uh, for us in North America with the invention of the professional association and founding the first program of its kind uh, at Harvard, in that context, the existing professional identities of architect, artist, gardener, engineer were perceived to be inadequate, and there needed to be a new professional who could responsibly deal with the social and environmental conditions by uh, founding the industrial city. In the 20th century, we saw a similar transition to a kind of what's been referred to as a mature Fordist economy in which the conditions of decentralization led by industry produce very new spatial conditions. And at that moment, ecological planning or landscape planning asserted itself as a set of tools. And then more recently, in the shift to the so-called post-Fordist neoliberal economy, we've seen the relative inability of architecture as an epistemology to keep pace. And into that void, uh, landscape architects have stepped very consequentially recently as the landscape urbanists uh, of our age. Thanks very much.